Hi, this is Chris Howard, host of Plugged In with Chris Howard, and I'm taking the Lions over the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Bet Online has free odds and lines available online or on your mobile device. Visit Bet Online today. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. With Capella University's game changing FlexPath learning format, you gain relevant skills you can apply to your career right away. Earn your degree from an accredited university and be confident in the quality of your education. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. Capella University is accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. Learn more at capella.edu slash accreditation. Welcome to the Media Roundtable Industry Edition, where we dive deep into events and topics around the business of audio through the lens of the brands and buyers who support it. I'm your host, Stu Redwine, VP Creative Services at Oxford Road. So in the industry edition of the Media Roundtable, we go a little further behind the scenes to talk about the business of audio and the secrets of the craft, which allows brands and creators to impact audiences and culture through the work they put out into the world. But first, you're probably familiar with Pod News. If you're not, you should be the industry's leading newsletter for podcasting. And I listen to the podcasts every day, Walking the Dog. And as we've mentioned before, they were recently acquired by Podcast Business Journal. So we struck up a conversation with James Cridlin, editor of Pod News, and said, hey, now that you're doing uh, business news, let's uh, team up. So James went for it, and today we're offering our fourth installment of the Media Roundtable with Podcast Business Journal, featuring the one and only James Cridlin on the panel, who's not only editor of Pod News and Podcast Business Journal, but also an official radio futurologist. So please welcome this very special panel. Like I said, James Cridlin, editor of Pod News and Podcast Business Journal. Thank you, Stu. It's great to be here. And Spencer Siemensen, media buyer at Oxford Road. Hi, everyone. Kristen Duenes coming in all the way from the East Coast, associate media director at Oxford Road. Hey, Stu. And the one and only Neil Lucy, EVP of strategy and product at Oxford Road. It's great to be back. No uh, truer words were ever spoken. We are never going to be more here than we are. So let's get started. Welcome to the Industry News with Podcast Business Journal. James, what stories do you have that our chief audio officers need to be paying attention to? Yes, and that was one of the stories, actually, your um, excellent uh, white paper about uh, chief audio officers, which is uh, a great uh, thing. Let me just um, uh, correct something you said. I think you said that Podcast Business Journal bought Pod News. It was the other way around. I bought I, I bought them. So uh, there we go. And uh, some of the things that we uh, covered this week uh, included a really interesting thing from um, Bjorn Thorleifsson, who is... Um, who's Icelandic, and he's from a company called Amp. He was talking about uh, companies needing a sonic toolkit, and this is most certainly something for a chief audio officer. Uh, He spoke to the Podcast Business Journal a couple of weeks ago um, about the opportunities for proper social strategies for your brand, and um, they also released a really interesting report highlighting companies with a a good sonic uh, toolkit uh, in there. Um, And I guess that's something, uh, Stu, that you have been uh, talking to quite a few people about in terms of making sure that it's not just, you know, a jingle or a piece of music, but they've actually got a full sonic toolkit that they can use uh, throughout all of their uh, brand uh, communications. Yes, indeed. It's such a powerful lever, right? It is a very clear way and a powerful way for someone to identify and distinguish a brand from another. And I think it's a great call out with Bjorn. He'll actually be joining the Ad Infinitum podcast, which is part of the Media Roundtable podcast, where we focus on creative here in just a few weeks, where we're going to be talking even more about this very subject. Excellent. Well, he was uh, he was super good. Um, we've we've actually had some really interesting uh, interviews over the last couple of weeks since uh, this uh, podcast has been away. Uh, Rebecca Sananes, who used to work for uh, Harry and Meghan, she got the job 
by replying to one of those weird LinkedIn uh, messages that you get. And it was, hey, we've got a, we've got an opportunity for you. And instead of consigning it to the spam, uh, she actually bothered to reply to it and ended up working for Harry and Meghan, which was uh, fairly amazing. But anyway, she's got some really good thoughts about funding shows made by, uh, well, you know, uh, saying that uh, shows have been funded over the last couple of weeks um, or indeed last couple of years um, by um, uh, by uh, large companies and really throwing lots of money to people that have never made any audio in the past. And then they wonder why it doesn't work. And so what she was saying is actually it's probably swinging back the other way now uh, in that the funding is going to people that really understand how audio works. And uh, it's a really interesting article. Uh, and also Tamara Zubiati, um, who uh, I'm sure a friend of the show working at uh, Barometer, um, she was talking about brand suitability and brand safety. And I have to tell you, I, as a creator, have always been a little bit sort of, you know, uneasy about that. And she really put my uh, thoughts uh, at rest there in terms of uh, why it's a good thing. So that was a really uh, that was a really helpful thing. Um, so some great interviews over the last uh, month or so at the Podcast Business Journal. Thank you so much, James. Uh, thank you for um, taking part in the media roundtable. It's such a pleasure to always have you uh, on the show. And now let's get into uh, the regular industry edition. Now for the Media Roundtable Industry Edition. Okay, Spencer, Neil, Kristen, and James, uh, let's dive right in. So our first story this week um, that our Oxford uh, roadies pulled out, Spencer, is with you. What do you have for us? Yes, I thought it would be a good thing that we address uh, Elon Musk renaming Twitter and taking all that brand recognition straight down the toilet. So Musk has plans to create a super app in the model laid forth by companies like WeChat in China, which has over 1 billion users. Super apps are apps which have several service components of which one is typically payments. And while a brand can manufacture press with something seemingly out of the blue, sustaining value needs to come from the product itself, and slapping a new logo on a problem doesn't change the problem. That comes from Caroline Gregorick from LinkedIn. This is on the heels of Twitter ad sales plunging to a whopping 59% and the platform making most of its money from advertising. Uh, Kristen, I know you have a lot to say about this. I would love I have, to start with you and hear your thoughts. I have feelings. Um, you have to consider that this is the same person who walked into the Twitter offices carrying a toilet. That is that is what he did. Um, so in some way, I think there was a bit of foreshadowing of what the eventuality would be. And you can say like, oh, changing the name to X, you know, at this point, I don't think it matters what he does and what name is changed and who he brings on as CEO. I think the damage is done. I think that, you know, you've got Mark Zuckerberg creating a, a viable um, counterpart to this. And I, I, I fully expect that that will start cleaning X formerly known as Twitter's clock. Like, I think that's what we're looking at. I think we're we're watching the demise of Twitter in real time. I feel pretty much the same way, especially knowing that he tried to change PayPal to X when he tried to acquire them in 2001, and that uh, led to his getting ousted. Mm -hmm. um, from a brand recognition standpoint, Neil, how do you feel about this change? Well, I mean, the the thing with Twitter is it has mass brand recognition, right? And I, it's, it's completely separate. And I know Kristen has thoughts on this too, but we had earlier this year, HBO, bye-bye uh, HBO, or just Max. And now we have Twitter. So two huge like media brands have gone through changes. Uh, I understand them in both situations because with HBO Max, kind of the merger with Discovery and those properties, um, although HBO's beloved brand name's got a really good sound signature too. <laughs> um, and then um, with Twitter, uh, I understand it in terms of where the app is going. They want to be an app for everything. So Twitter no longer, the Twitter name no longer represents what the brand ambition is is going to be. 
So from that from that end, I understand the changes. It's just you're 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 trading off a ton of brand equity to make those changes. Um, maybe in the case of Twitter, you've already killed the brand so much that it just doesn't matter. Uh, so there's that aspect of it. You've taken so much value out of the brand. Does it really matter that Twitter's going away? Hmm. We can argue. Um, no I doubt it's to, always. To, uh, sorry, sorry, Stu. I stand corrected. Uh, Elon Musk was carrying a sink, not a toilet. But the analogy stands: down the drain, down the toilet. <laughs> Either way, everything's going down. All right. Yeah, it's so hard uh, to look away from um, from uh, Elon. But my question would be for you guys, given the nature of this program, uh, why does this matter to a chief audio officer? Other than uh, it's fun to talk about Elon. What uh, is there any trend that we see developing here that matters in audio? Yeah, Spencer. Yeah, um, super apps are becoming way more of a thing um, when it comes to audio. We've talked about this in the AAO paper and several other platforms that creators today have to be a multi hyphenate. They have to do it all. And one of the things is video. Um, as video becomes more prevalent and TikTok becomes a greater presence in our social landscape, uh, different audio apps are trying to compete. So you have Spotify, for instance, trying to be TikTok, it's trying to be Snapchat alongside being an audio, everything, you know, they're even folding in audio books. It is also a super app. And that is kind of where we're going to see everything trending in the next 10 years as internet culture grows and grows and things become one-stop shops. And I know that the next story uh, we have, you also brought uh, for this week that does relate to one of those folks with perhaps super app aspirations, Spotify, everybody's talking a bit about this, how they're doing. Um, So why don't you fill us in? Yeah. Um, So there's a recent report that users rose from 27% to 551 million. Uh, But despite the impressive growth in active users and podcast ad revenue, Spotify's stock price took a hit. They added a dollar to the current subscription service. User growth is great, but the financial markets want to see profitability. And despite the strong top line results, Spotify's EPS earnings per share is in the negative per Yahoo Finance. Um, For financial news, I want to go to Neil. Neil. What does this mean for the CAO? What does this mean? Um, I think that what it means is Spotify has done a really good job of acquiring audiences, um, but they've got to turn those audiences into profit. And and that's what the financial markets are responding to. So for the CAO, I I mean, the fact is they still have huge audiences. Their paid subscribers grew. Their free subscribers, ad-supported subscribers grew. So that's all great for us as advertisers, as reaching more people with our advertising. From a financial perspective, I think their, you know, their income is negative 302 million or something like that off of three over off of revenue of three billion. So the financial markets are, I think, responding to the fact that you've got the audience. We want to see results. And maybe James has some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, and Spotify have just put their prices up uh, as well. Apparently, they've put their prices up 50 times so far, but never in the US until now. So um, that will uh, potentially help them. Although my understanding is that uh, the way that um, Spotify gets charged by the record companies is, is as a percentage of their income. So actually, they won't necessarily make any more profit out of this. But in any case, um, the thing that I found really interesting was the amount of money that their apparent change in podcast strategy uh, has uh, ended up costing them um, more than uh, $57 million in content asset write-offs in uh, getting rid of uh, human beings as well from their company uh, and all of that. So a big amount of uh, change going on there. But I mean, I, 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 you know, always look at the stock market with kind of um, um, uh, 
bewilderment um, i'm never quite sure that i understand what it is that they are uh, particularly excited about clearly they want profit at the end of the day but uh, spotify is actually um, moving more to profit even in these in these numbers as well so um you know sometimes you can never quite second guess what the, the market wants i guess yeah i i noted that in their earnings report they talk about that the the losses are primarily the result of streamlining operations as well as reducing costs. So that's a lot of money <laughs> that they've lost to kind of write the ship, right? Yeah, it is. It's an awful lot of money. I mean, and I have to say some of that is bad contracts that were probably signed three or so years ago. I mean, um, uh, we also heard a couple of weeks ago about Audio Boom's financials. And Audio Boom, again, uh, they ended up um, losing uh, quite a lot of money and their stock price went down. But one of the reasons why they lost quite a lot of money uh, is that they made really um, uh, bad guarantees for uh, one of their contracts, which was signed in quarter one of 22, when everything was rosy. It lasts until July 2025. And they basically had to buy themselves out of that. And it's cost them $9 million. So that was a bad, bad contract. So you can see, I suspect that there are quite a few of these, you know, hidden landmines, uh, you know, occurring uh, in uh, large podcast companies all over the world. All right. So tell me if you've ever heard of any of these companies. Indeed, Shopify, NetSuite, Headspace, Quip, Theragun, Postmates. You know, I'm not only the host of the Media Roundtable, but also CEO of a company called Oxford Road. And we are the world's leading independently owned and operated audio ad agency. And what that means is that we help great companies, many that you have probably heard of on some of the other podcasts that you listen to. We help them test and scale campaigns in audio channels with podcasts being one of those leading channels. Some of the work that we do includes media planning and buying, as well as analytics, attribution and insights. And we also have a very special way that we deal with uh, creative and copy generation. We have our own proprietary process called Audiolytics that allows us to score ads for their persuasiveness. If you're looking to be involved in audio and you want a partner that can help work with you to make sure that you achieve unprecedented ROI and massive scale, you should get in touch with us at Oxford Road. And by the way, the only reason that we're able to do the work of the Media Roundtable is because we have a great team at Oxford Road that supports us and makes it possible. So, you know, what we're doing is not just a podcast, but we're really trying to help brands live out their values and balance that with their business objectives, which is an increasingly hard thing to do in this world of misinformation and malice that's infecting so much of our media. But at Oxford Road, we don't want to just broker this stuff. We want to impact the industry for good. We want to raise the bar on what gets created. And Oxford Road is helping make that possible through the Media Roundtable. So if you're somebody that's interested in working with an ad agency or a partner on this type of work for your advertising campaigns, go to OxfordRoad.com. It's easy to spell. And get in touch with us or at least just sign up for our free newsletter, The Influencer. That's OxfordRoad.com. This is Chris Howard, host of Plugged In with Chris Howard. The Kansas City Chiefs are heading to their fourth final in five years against a stacked San Francisco 49ers team. Not surprisingly, the Chiefs are currently a one and a half point underdog. BetOnline is your number one source for up to the minute odds, stats, trends, and lines. You can access the world's best wagering information from your desktop or your mobile device. Head to BetOnline today to stay updated on all the action. BetOnline, the game starts here. This episode is brought to you by AARP. Ten years from today, Lisa Schneider will trade in her office job to become the leader of a pack of dogs. As the owner of her own dog rescue, that is. A second act made possible by the reskilling courses Lisa's taking now with AARP to help make sure her income lives as long as she does. And she can finally run with the big dogs. And the small dogs, who just think they're big dogs. 
That's why the younger you are, the more you need AARP. Learn more at aarp.org slash skills. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you uh, very much. The landscape continues to change. Something that we're seeing a ton of change in uh, is in creative uh, particularly with generative uh, AI and then with programmatic. So one of the stories uh, that I identified was ACAS at Veritonic put together a study where they were analyzing the common threads and differences in programmatic ads from around the world. And on the face of it, it's sort of like, okay, just the facts, right? It's like a programmatic ads uh, have a majority more female voices, a uh, single voice with no sound effects or music um, and her 30 seconds long. And it's kind of like, oh, that's interesting. That's good to know. I guess if I was designing an ad for that, I would need to do. And then it's like, wait, hold up. Why? Why are they like that? What? Why is there a lack of any um, sort the w- w- where is the um, um, the creativity in that in the sense that if we're not careful, as things get more programmatic we uh, inherently are going to want to remove variables to make it more predictable about what's going into the break. Um, And so at first to kind of looking at this, it's like, kind of like, Oh, that's interesting. That's good to know about that. But then that the second kind of reaction to it is like, wait, hold on. Are if, if that's what we say ads like that for that space are like, then that's going to become this self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh no. And before we know it, podcast ad breaks are going to sound just like, uh, radio ad breaks. Kristen, I know you had um, some thoughts on this as well. Uh, what do you think about the trends here? Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, there there's a lot of buzz in different media outlets right now talking about the, the programmatic DAI insertions into, you know, what has traditionally been post read podcast ads and what's that what what it's doing to the marketplace what it's doing to the listener experience and it's the word jarring keeps coming up um it's funny because i first heard that come out of my own mouth and then i i read it in another article and it's it's true it's the only word i can really think of because we're so used to you know 15 plus years of a podcast having the host as in content, part of, of, you know, the whole podcast as a whole, speaking about a brand that presumably they believe in, presumably that they use. And all of a sudden it's changing into these canned, sounds like it came directly from radio ads and it doesn't fit the content. Um, it doesn't fit the experience. And I, I believe that we've got more listeners rage fast forwarding through these ads and we have actually listening to them. And the frustrating part of this is that it we're still as advertisers paying for the impression, whether somebody actually listened to it or not. Um, so it's, it's something that is harmful to our clients who are on the air. It's harmful to the podcaster because now you've, you know, they're, the ads aren't working. The advertisers aren't going to renew. They're ultimately going to lose money over this. And the only people it really benefits is the network. So it's something that I'm fairly passionate about and have spoken to several of our network partners as well, saying this has got to change. Um, and on top of that, and on top of just like programmatic ads not fitting the space, sometimes they're just jamming these ad breaks in where it makes zero sense to. Um, literally sometimes in the middle of a sentence um, with no consideration to content. So it's even more of an in, like interruption into that whole listener experience. Very rage inducing. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think we have to come to terms with programmatic is here to stay. And, you know, there's value in programmatic, but there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of how how we're using programmatic Um as Kristen says, do you want to, I mean, if, if an episode doesn't have natural breaks, where do you put the ads? So does it just kind of break in the middle of somebody's sentence, then you have an ad break. Uh, That's not the best user experience. And I I don't think anybody wants that. I mean, certainly the consumers don't want that, right? 
Um, and I think even with host red rat ads, so, oh yeah, we can have it, you know, you can still get your host red ads programmatically, but it may not be the first ad. It may be stuck in the middle of a break somewhere. So is that what we want? So there is, I think there's things that need to be worked out to, to kind of hopefully tap into the, the advantages of programmatic while not killing the experience too. Yeah. And it feels like, like for all the advantages that it brings, what, what I was trying to highlight there at the beginning is like, let's just be careful to go. Are we, are we checking our brains at the door at any step in this process? Like Neil, I know you also shared that article, um, the fully produced podcast ad, are we leaving attention on the table? And, and in general, like the sense that I got from Matt uh, Mice that wrote that was sort of just like an autopilot approach to filling this. So it's like, now we got this new automated way to do this. So then we do this like autopilot kind of creative. And that's what the, the subtext of what was in there of like, oh, they all sound the same. They're all the same length. They've all got, uh, they've all got a, a low number of variables as opposed to trying to make creative that Sounds po podcasty, like Paul Riz Mandel was saying in his article, why podcast ad creative is pivotal um, now more than never, which Neil, you also had shared with us. Thank you for that. Um, kind of making the same uh, point that we've got to continue to fight for it. And I, I'd be curious with you, James, being a radio futurologist, um, you know, what, what is your point of view on this as you see programmatic uh, becoming, you know, increasingly an important uh, piece of the entire system. Yeah, I mean, it's it's much the same as any new technology uh, that you see. Some things that we do with that new technology, voice tracking on radio or, you know, automation, a computer playout system rather than playing uh, vinyl or playing CDs, um, those can be misused as well as used really, really well. And I think from this point of view, um, there's a lot of really bad programmatic uh, out there. Um, there are some shows where the ad comes in 15 dB quieter than the rest of the uh, of the content, and that's a complete waste of time for everybody. Um, and so I think it's just making sure that we're actually using the tools that we have correctly. I, um, you know, I used to write radio commercials a long, long time ago, and I certainly wouldn't put some of the rather more shouty radio commercials that, as Paul Rismandel was saying, you know, are designed to attract your attention. They already have your attention if you're in a podcast. So you don't need any of that. Um, and I think, you know, to quote the great Dan Granger, um, uh, you know, programmatic and reusing radio advertising is one of those short-sighted compromises that has driven the way we have approached programmatic in this industry. Um, and I think we should just be using the tools that we have, which are great tools, and just using them better. Absolutely. And there's a lot of uh, talk in the space around this. Like, it's good we're all, if, we, if we're aware of the problem, we know we've got a problem so we can all be working on fixing it. And and the next story I know, Neil, you've got is kind of, yeah. you know, more on this same kind of theme. Yeah, I was just going to say that, I mean, I think there's some thread. There's a thread I, that kind of goes from the Veritonic ACAS study to the Signal Hill Insights uh, research on programmatic and the fact that two thirds of people who heard a radio ad in a, in a podcast um, found it annoying. So, you know, as James mentioned, you've already got people's attention. It's an intimate environment. You don't need to kind of interrupt them, take advantage of that environment that they're leaning into. So the, the last piece is uh, Magellan did their latest uh, benchmark report and, um, you know, it's there's great news in it. So ad spending grew 24 percent, uh, which was driven by a lot of new brands coming into the market. Um, 30 second spots have increased to 40 percent of the reported spending and ad loads have increased slightly. So, I mean, when on the overall basis, still very uncluttered, I think ad loads are around six percent. There is more clutter in certain places, so true crime, higher demand, ad loads around 8%. What I thought was interesting, though, was for shows that are under 15 minutes, ad loads are almost 20% of the content. So that's starting to get into radio, where I think when wow. we talked on Friday, it was 40 <laughs> minutes of content and 20 minutes of ads. And, um, and, and, you know, the thing about the 30s 
being 40%. So it was like, oh, it's still the majority aren't 30s. It's actually, they are the majority of the ad units. It's just that, you know, there's, there's share in other ad units as well. So, um, and that to me speaks to kind of not necessarily taking advantage of the podcast medium, the host read, the Billy's tell stories, kind of taking advantage of, you know, what all that the hosts bring to the, to the party. And it's partly kind of driven by brand advertising as well, which is now basically about 50%. So the, the, uh, the split between DR and brand is almost 50, 50 now, according to the Magellan report. Well, and, and you have to consider that the, the networks that are most guilty of increasing the ad loads during longer shows are the ones that have traditional radio experience where they, this is what they know and it's what they've known for decades. And so they're trying to force podcast into a radio mold and it just doesn't quite fit. So that is something that should be taken into consideration. And hopefully we all learn something from it and they can scale that back a little bit. 100%. And to tie it into the last two articles as well, this um, report also talks about the rise in simulcast and everyone's like, it works so well. Um, And that is, of course, the proliferation of a video, but also just truly simulcast is one of the last vestiges of baked in, even faked in audio with a baked in component. You do have the video forever. And while some might not work for people because it skews too young and that's just an issue for any D2C product or anything that skews older for a high household income, um, your baked in is always going to work better than your DI. It could be because of the proliferation of programmatic. It could be because of high frequency, some inability to target for Ron Geo. Um, there's a whole host of reasons why DI has its problems and why it needs to be watched very closely by its buying team. But Really, that's the the baked in works. Crazy to say, but it works uh, better than anything else for a reason. That's like, is that your tagline? Baked in works. Yeah, I have that's many a, taglines. Uh, so, Stu yes. from Stu from a creative perspective, um, you want to take advantage of the host and you want them to tell their personal story. How do you feel about thirties to do that? You know, uh, it can be done. A lot of the times the people that choose to be in that seat um have a way with words so it can be done but you know age old sort of uh axiom the more you tell the more you sell and i think when it feels like it breaks out of the mold even if just for a few seconds kind of uh it doesn't quite feel like every other ad in the break so while i don't want to be so hard and fast like oh there's no way it can't be done i think it can um you know it never hurts Like, that's the thing. And all these head to heads we've done over the years is like, yes, we could put together a group of air checks with some performance numbers where you're going to hear a really dynamic, interesting read where somebody's talking about how they use the product and you're going to hear a super flat read that doesn't sound good. And and then, oh, you know, big shock. The one that was flat outperformed the one that was more personal sounding. But I feel like it's the exception that proves the rule. Like for for me, approaching it creatively is, is like it never hurts. It doesn't hurt for them to make that personal connection. And to your point, like if they've got some more time and if we could create different types of units, right, where you're, there's a premium perhaps for them to do that. What well, if everything is going to continue to pull down and next thing you know, we're going to have 18 minutes of breaks like they do on radio and podcasts, then that's going to become that much more rare and precious to have the host actually giving that live personal connection to the product. You know what, it might also be from a media perspective, pre-rolls are often less skipped than mid-rolls on longer uh, shows. And as comedy grows, it's getting longer and longer with the interview style. So a three-hour podcast, a pre-roll is better than a mid-roll. And also pre-rolls, you can buy a 30, but if it's a good enough product, they will go longer. So you might be paying for a 30 at a lower cost than a a mid-roll, but actually getting a 60. So it that might also be an optimization that you should think about um, as a CAO for some of your campaigns if you're not seeing great performance. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know uh, as we were prepping for this one last week and, you know, Kristen, you're talking about people rage skipping ads, you're pretty fired up and you stayed up late for us. So I just want to toss to you one more time here. Is there, is there anything else in the, uh, on everything that we've covered here that, that people need to be watching out for as the space evolves? Um, I think that, I mean, what they need to be watching out for is going to keep evolving as the space evolves, right? So today, the name of the game is programmatic and bringing back the baked ins, right? We want to maintain that experience for our clients. Who knows what tomorrow is going to bring? Um, there's, I think there's always going to be something as podcast keeps growing and changing and, and shows keep changing hands. I think that there's, um, there's a lot coming and we'll just have to see how it all shakes out. And, you know, I'll have opinions once we see what, what happens. I'm going to count on it. All <laughs> right. Well, thank you guys for joining the media roundtable this week. This podcast is brought to you by Oxford Road, where we want you to succeed in audio and to use your influence for good. As members of the marketing community, we have the power to advance voices that don't just entertain, but edify, to build bridges instead of burning them, and to rise above our differences and show that collaboration is possible when we treat each other with respect. If you're a marketer looking to align with our vision, reach out to our agency, Oxford Road, by visiting OxfordRoad.com and subscribing to our weekly newsletter, The Influencer. Thank you to our guests and to Bianca, Kyle, Haley, and the team at Podcast One. As always, influence responsibly. Rack your look for spring at Nordstrom Rack. And save up to 60% on brands you love. Rag & Bone, Vince, Marc Jacobs, Adidas, Joes, and more. Great brands, great prices every day at Nordstrom Rack. Score new dresses, denim, sandals, designer bags, and sunglasses. Plus, updates for the family and home. Get your spring on for less, up to 60% less, today at your Nordstrom Rack store. What will you find? The reviews are in for McDonald's hotter, juicier burgers. Let's hear what Hamburglar has to say. Bravo, bravo. What our old friend Hamburglar said is, the patties are juicier. The bun is a thing of beauty. The cheese perfectly melted. Bravo. My burger dreams have come true. You heard him, folks. These are McDonald's best burgers ever. ba da ba ba Bravo. Available at most restaurants in this area. Comparison of McDonald's classic burgers to prior burgers.